As an eight-year-old boy, he fled his home country Curaçao with his brother and mother because his dad could not stay off the liquor. They ended up in Amsterdam South, the Netherlands. As a small boy, he excels in football and eventually ends up playing for Ajax's youth team. But after his training was finished, he and his brother would often hang on the corners in his neighborhood, the paper, and cause nuisance. From that moment on, it only got worse. As soon as he lost one of the most important things in his life, he became a different person. He would climb up the criminal ladder rapidly and forgot everything his mother once taught him. Be a good person. This is the story of Gwyneth Martha, also known as the man without a shadow, and one of the key figures in the Mokro War, one of the most famous criminals in Dutch history that always knew he was not going to make it until retirement, but the way it ended was in movie like manner. Born on the 7th of February 1974, Martha grew up in Curaçao with his father, mother and brother. His father had a hard time staying sober, which caused him to lash out against his family. His mother decided she had had enough and made the brave decision to move out of the country in the hopes of a better future for her and her sons. A decision she ultimately might have regretted heavily. They ended up in Amsterdam South, the paper. This is where Martha would show his talents with the ball, playing football with his friends. It did not take long before he was scouted by Ajax to join the youth teams. He would go on to do fairly well, but once off the field, he would start committing petty crimes with his little brother. The two were inseparable. Giovanni, his brother, was more of a hothead, whereas Gwinnett was more thoughtful. As more of their friends joined their petty crimes, they slowly became a street gang. Soon enough, Gwinnett was not playing for Ajax anymore as he chose the path of a criminal rather than that of a footballer. Which would you choose? A criminal or a football career? Let me know in the comments. Fast forward to the 5th of March 1992, a month after his 18th birthday. Something tragic happened that would change his life forever. He and his crew went out to the club Escape in the city centre of Amsterdam. Crew members of his got into an argument with a crew from Amsterdam West. The argument proceeded to go on outside and quickly escalated. Once outside, Mohamed Mumi C fired at Giovanni, Gwinnett's brother, which caused him to lose his life in the arms of his big brother. From that point on, Gwinnett wanted nothing else but revenge. Unfortunately for him, he had to wait. Mumi was sentenced to eight years in jail, but Gwinnett had patience. After 11 years of patience, on the 14th of October 2003, he finally returned the favour and Mumi was no more. Mumi was in the coffee shop ruthless when a man with a helmet on entered the building and pulled the trigger. Gwinnett was never sentenced for this as there was not enough evidence that pointed in his direction. People around him said that he was never the same after the loss of his brother. In the meantime, Martha and his crew progressed from petty crimes to serious, violent robberies. Their street robberies got increasingly more violent and turned into store robberies. Those store robberies then turned into serious bank robberies. The Dutch police started a big investigation into Martha and his crew, which ultimately led him to being arrested. Prosecutors demanded a 10-year jail sentence for Gwinnett for the violent robberies, but he got very lucky. He only gets one and a half year jail for possession of firearms and drug dealing and is acquitted of the rest. Halfway through the 90s, Gwinnett Martha and his gang also start to make serious moves in the drug trade as they start importing cocaine from South America. The money they made during these robberies is invested in these shipments. They are starting to make a small fortune and spend it on watches, designer clothes and bottles in the club to flaunt their wealth. This caused Dutch police to start an investigation into his money laundering activities. They decided to send out an observation team and have him followed 24-7. But Gwinnett was not a rookie. His nickname was not the man without a shadow for nothing. It was a name he earned. Even the most experienced detectives could not get a grip on him. Within the police department, they also knew he was very hard to track. Once, an observation team placed a tracker underneath his car, but Gwinnett noticed it and decided to make a counter move. He placed the tracker underneath a car of the surveillance team. This led to great confusion for the observation team as all of a sudden they realized they were following their colleagues. Gwinnett in his turn proceeds to drive off peacefully. This is one of his many boss moves, which he had made to shake off observation teams. 
The observation team later revealed that he would often blink or wave to them when he saw them on the street, all while they obviously thought he had absolutely no clue they were following him. He once even taunted them by placing a blue siren, similar to what they had, on his car and speeded off. He was mocking them, and they knew it. Unlike his criminal friends, he does not make stupid phone calls that can be tapped. He uses scanners to find trackers, and also uses jammers for potential trackers just to be extra safe. But the observation team also had their fair share of successes. In March 2009, they see Gwinnett at a gas station, where he is handed a big black bag. He proceeded to drive back to the house of Malika Kay, his girlfriend at the time. Police suspected it to be a stash house and organised a raid. On the 3rd of April, they indeed raided the home and found two watches worth 100,000 euros and large amounts of cash. Police raided another home Gwinnett often visited and arrested Gwinnett. When he had to appear for the courts, the judge asked him how he was able to have so much cash and expensive items without having any income. Gwinnett proceeds to explain that he has sold some weed and at a clothing store in Amsterdam. He went on to say that he should have declared his income but he forgot. As to why he did not have a bank account, he answered that he was too lazy to go through all the paperwork. The judge did not believe a word he said and sentenced him to seven years jail on the 15th of April, 2008. But you'd think he would stay there for long. Well, you are wrong. On Monday, May 28th, 2008, not even a month later, Gwinnett does something truly spectacular. He escaped from prison in a movie-like way together with another inmate. They managed to climb over the first fence as Gwinnett manages to climb over the second one, his inmate gets stuck and caught right outside the prison. There are two men waiting on him in a stolen Volkswagen van. They proceed to drive off and the escape was a success. The van was later found, of course, without any sign of Gwinnett and his accomplices. It was not until the 28th of October 2009, a year and a half after his escape, that he gets busted during a routine traffic stop in Antwerp. He is immediately jailed and extradited a bit later on the 6th of January back to the Netherlands. Besides a jail sentence, he is ordered to pay back 16 million euros to the government for money laundering. But as Gwinnett is released after his four-year jail sentence, he will have much bigger things to worry about. On the last Friday of the year 2013, Gwinnett had an angel on his shoulder. As he walks with a friend through Amsterdam South, an unidentified man jumps in front of him. He puts his weapon on Gwinnett's head and pulls the trigger multiple times. The weapon jams. After a short scuffle, the man runs off and Gwinnett just survived a hit on his life. Gwinnett went to the nearest police station and filed a police report and requested police protection, which is interesting to note because he is a big criminal himself. I thought criminals never speak with the police, let alone ask for protection. Well, Gwinnett did and was shortly interrogated, but it did not result in anything. As Gwinnett told the officers he did not have anything to tell, which in return prompted the police to deny him any protection. The suspected hitman was never identified. Gwinnett just knew it was ordered by a former friend of him. This former friend was Alex Alecki Gillis. On the 20th of February, Gwinnett orders a successful hit on Gillis and took his life but that absolutely did not mean that there were no other threats on Gwinnett's life. Thursday the 22nd of May 2014 is the day. Gwinnett is in a shawarma shop, Ruse, on the Amsterdamseweg in Amstelveen with his bodyguard and associate. This associate actually took the blame when both of them were caught in a car that had two loaded guns a month earlier. While the two are still in the shawarma shop, two other men join them. Gwinnett then leaves the shop with one of those men. As they walk outside, a BMW turns up, and then it all happens very quickly. Gwinnett is shot at with a Kalashnikov, and at least one other automatic weapon. He has hit 80, yes, you heard that correctly, 80 times. The man he was with managed to flee and did not get hit. The car quickly drives off, and is found a few hours later burned out in Diamen. That was the end of Gwinnett Martha then and there. This makes you wonder, was this a setup for him to come outside? So they could finish the job? Were those two guys in on it? Definitely share your thoughts. From Ajax youth player to one of the biggest criminals in the country, well, this was the story of Gwinnett Martha, who escaped from prison, survived hits on his life, but ultimately still had his life taken. He is also one of the key pieces to the deadly Mokro War, 
Stay tuned for another video about that, it's wild. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe.